Good afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, our Executive Director, Chris Costa, is joined by Kenneth L. Weinstein, Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security, which we will call by its acronym DHS. Secretary Weinstein is responsible for providing the DHS Secretary, DHS Senior Leadership, DHS Components and State, Local, Tribal, Territorial, and Private Sector Partners with the Homeland Security Intelligence and Information needed to keep the country safe, secure, and resilient. Secretary Weinstein serves as the Chief Intelligence Officer for DHS and reports directly to the DHS Secretary and Director of National Intelligence. Prior to his confirmation in June of 2022, Secretary Weinstein was a litigation partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell. During his time in private practice, he also served as a commissioner on the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, as a member of the Public Interest Declassification Board, and in a number of other national security organizations. The secretary previously spent over 20 years in law enforcement and national security positions in the federal government, including as chief of staff to FBI Director Robert S. Mueller III and Homeland Security Advisor to President George W. Bush. After Chris, and the secretary finished their discussion, we'll turn to your questions. Please use the Q&A feature to write them in. I will do my best to ask as many of them as possible, but we kind of expect there to be a lot. So forgive me if I don't get to them. Enough from me, over to you, Chris. Amanda, as always, thank you very much for the great introduction. Secretary, a belated Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us today. This is our kickoff our first spy chat in 2024. And it's an honor and privilege to have you join us today. You are extremely busy, I know, as the discussion will cover the waterfront and our guests will get a sense on how busy you are, in fact. So I'd like to dive right in. But again, welcome and thank you. So for our audience, could you just dive right in and provide a brief overview of what it is your office does to address the evolving threats to the U.S. homeland. And then I have a follow-on question in terms of privacy and civil liberty. So we're definitely opening up with uh, an interesting question. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, and first, let me say uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you all, um, both to be with you uh, and Amanda and the rest of the team, but also um, to spend time with you given your illustrious career and what you've done for the uh, American people and our, our country. Um, and also just to be um, talking with a group of folks affiliated with the Spy Museum, which is a wonderful institution. So Thank it's uh, tremendous for me to be here and it's an honor to be invited. Um, I um, Let me just take one moment and sort of step back in answer to your question um, about what it is that we do. And it's it seems like it should be that's an obvious question, but there's not really an obvious answer. And it, by that, I mean, if you look at the name of our organization, the DHS Office of Intelligence Analysis, that doesn't sort of signify exactly what it is that we do. What are the parameters of our areas of jurisdiction? And you sort of have to go back and look at the legislation that stood us up post 9-11. In many ways, INA, actually, in all ways, INA was a result of 9-11. It was a result of the recognition after 9-11 that we did not here in this country have a sufficient apparatus and culture and set of rules to create a functioning intelligence operation throughout the homeland. We certainly had it overseas with our adversaries, but we didn't have a sufficient ability to identify, detect, and then act on threats before they became a reality, like they did on that tragic day on 9-11. And so INA was stood up to, with basically three missions in mind. And this is what sort of we, we explain whenever asked about sort of our mandate. Um, 
one mission is what I just said, is to work with our partners. We're, DHS is a department of partnerships. We're all about partnering. INA in particular, our job is to work with partners and develop those partnerships that make us all stronger. So our first mission is to work with our partners to stand up that intelligence capability. And by, by intelligence, I mean preventive. In other words, unlike law enforcement, and I was in law enforcement for many years, the mission of law enforcement is to gather evidence to prosecute crimes and put people away for acts that they've already committed, right? That doesn't stop a 9-11. You need the preventive capability, and that is what the intelligence capability brings. So our job is to work uh, with all our partners to develop a network by which we can share intelligence from the intelligence community here, the federal intelligence community, the DHS components, to all the state, local, territorial, tribal, and private sector partners, all of whom have a role in Korea and Homeland. So that's mission number one. Related to that is mission number two, which is um, we are the statutory, statutorily mandated and identified federal agency that is the lead for sharing information with our state and local territorial, tribal, and private sector partners. And so that's our job. And, uh, and we, we'll talk a little later, I guess, about sort of the, the ways that we disseminate intelligence to all our partners. Um, and then a third mission, in many ways, is really the paramount one, which is we need to do missions one and mission two with in full alignment with the principles, constitutional principles, protections of you know privacy, civil liberties, civil rights, and civil liberties. And that is the case, obviously, for all intelligence agencies, for all law enforcement agencies. But it's particularly the case here where, as I said, mission number one is talking about doing intelligence in the United States. And that is a very fraught mission, right? Because here we have constitutional protections in place uh, in ways that we don't overseas. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that at every turn we are taking steps to further missions one and mission two with a, an eye completely on the protection of privacy, civil liberties, uh, and civil rights. And um, so we have spent a lot of time over the years, and in particular at the behest of our secretary over the last year and a half since I've been here, to strengthen our ability to conduct oversight of the operations of ourselves and our partners to make sure that we are um, performing our intelligence mission, but doing it with due regard for privacy and civil liberties protections. So that's just sort of a general overview of our mission space. Let me follow up. First of all, that was comprehensive. And our audience who tracked us when we did our spy chat with, with Director Ray heard some of the same themes because DHS operates both in the intelligence and the law enforcement space. So it's important, of course, to talk about privacy issues, and I really appreciate your articulation of that. So speaking of privacy, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That's very important legislation, very important tool, and yet uh, it's still hung up, as I understand it, with Congress. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of Section 702, define it, and also we can we can quickly address why some individuals are concerned, again, about civil liberties. No, thanks for asking about that. And um, let me just give a little thumbnail on, on 702. So 702 is the uh, provision in a law that was passed in 2008 that updated the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that was initially passed back in 1978 that governed the procedures that were required before the government could do national security intelligence, um, wiretaps, electronic surveillance. And um, that um, the initial FISA Amendments Act passed in 2008, 702 was part of that law that created a, a program by which the um, intelligence community could do electronic surveillance of individuals, foreign individuals who were overseas and do so without having to go to the court and get a you know, full um, court order for every individual um, surveillance, uh, which is absolutely critical because obviously in the counterterrorism effort, which was of sort of paramount importance and significance back at the time, post 
uh, you needed to be able to sort of nimbly surveil overseas terrorist suspects and not have to go get put together a 50 page submission to the court and go to the court and then three months later go up on that person's phone or device or whatever. Uh, and it was absolutely critical. And this all grew out of the fact that technology had changed so much back since 1978 that it needed to be updated. And that was the reason for the law. It passed in 2008. And the reason why I feel very, well, one of the reasons I feel very strongly about this issue is because I was one of the people, I was at the Department of Justice, the head of the National Security Division at the time. And so I spent a lot of time working with people up on the Hill, members who were actively involved in this and creating this the final package that is the FISA Amendments Act in 702, which has done so much to protect America since then. And it's the product of really good work by people like Sheldon Whitehouse and other senators and members who really um, did, the, did what we want to see in the national security legislation space. They recognized the need for the tool that we needed, that we wanted, but also the need to make sure that there are sufficient civil liberties protections in place. And that's what they did in the, uh, the result was this program that has been very valuable and has been reauthorized since uh, on a regular basis. That provision 702 is now up for reauthorization um, and Congress is looking hard at it. And there um, are concerns, civil liberties concerns about how it's used. Uh, and it's, um, it's, you know, there's, there's a very vigorous debate going on. My point about this is I, I applaud the debate. I think with all national security tools, all investigative authorities, um, it's really important that Congress looks at those, makes sure that they are productive and worth the candle, but at the same time that they have all the protections in place that are needed. And um, if you look at those two sort of categories of information, the importance of the tool and the civil liberties protections that are in place and can be in place, it's absolutely, it's, it's imperative that Congress reauthorize this, le this legislation. I mean, if you look at, for example, the president's daily brief, which is sort of the most important intelligence that's generated every day, a large percentage of that intelligence in the president's daily brief comes from electronic surveillance uh, collection under 702. And um, this is against targets that are critical threats to us, against Chinese cyber efforts against us, against the fentanyl uh, cartel fentanyl traffickers. Um, they're, uh, uh, the record is replete with examples of 702 being used against the fentanyl trade, against the cartels, against the narcotics that are being trafficked into our country and killing our kids. Um, so, you know, the cyber threat. Uh, corporate America actually benefits from what we learn about the external cyber threat. Um, and so that in, in ways we learn from that intelligence, ways that corporate the corporations can better protect their systems. So in myriad areas, the need is there. It's, it's abundantly clear. And then if you look at the protections that are in place, those that were put in place back in 2008, those that have been put in place in the reauthorization since, and those that are sort of being considered now that would give greater comfort that the tool is being used appropriately, but at the same time, retain its utility so that it can still be used, it can still be used nimbly, and it can still be used effectively against our adversaries. So that is um, you know, just kind of a thumbnail sketch of the state of play of the debate over 702, just so that you know, we don't use 702 here at DHS. We're not allowed to. We don't have covert collection authorities. So I'm actually speaking as somebody who is a recipient of the intelligence and sees how valuable it is, how absolutely critical it is that we continue to get that intelligence. And also as somebody who's just been involved in the process since 2008, and I feel quite strongly that um, it absolutely must be reauthorized and reauthorized in a way that it can continue to be useful. Well, I appreciate you, you making that distinction. I just would reiterate as a consumer of intelligence in my last assignment at the White House, I couldn't have done counterterrorism work threat warning without being a recipient of the PDB and, uh, and certainly the authorities that came along with Section 702. So thank you very much. That was very helpful. So I want to pivot to October 7th to maybe some practical examples. As a result of October 7th, your boss, Secretary Mayorkas at DHS, 
the Homeland Secretary, had reiterated that the threats uh, directed against Jewish targets, Muslim targets, and Arab American targets in the United States before the holidays had gone up. Uh, I don't want to use the word exponential because I would be mischaracterizing, but certainly it, there was an increase in the threat environment. And I think there were some very specific public announcements about that. Maybe you can specifically talk about how did your office that you're charged with with threat warning, how did you respond to these particular threats for the homeland? Yeah, this has been um, pretty a sobering experience since October 7th. Um, and just to step back and take a look at the threat, um, and I believe this is what the secretary has spoken to and, and others, Chris Ray and others. Um, what we saw with October 7th was um, you know, it, it wasn't that these were new threats, but there, the events of October 7th set off sort of a chain reaction of that mobilized threat actors to, to act contrary to our interests in a variety of different ways, sort of all at once. So um, you can see that because if you take a look at what happened with the horrific attacks on October 7th, and then see the different threat vectors that sort of came alive um, and that might still come alive as a result of that. You obviously, you had Hamas itself perpetrating this terrible attack. And while they haven't targeted the homeland in the past, uh, given what they did that day, uh, the raises the prospect that they would, especially with the United States supporting Israel in the response. So there's that. You also have the fact that um, Iran and Iran's proxies are all reacting uh, to that in a variety of different ways. Hezbollah in a variety of ways in the north of, uh, of Israel. Um, and then the other Iranian proxies um, supporting the cause against Israel uh, in different ways. You have the foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS and Al Qaeda, though not necessarily aligned with Hamas, um, reacting, responding in a way that um, demonstrates that they have sympathy for the Hamas cause. And you've heard calls on social media by the foreign terrorist organizations um, for attacks against Jewish interests and American interests and in facilities around the world. And then he, here in the United States, you also have racially motivated, racially motivated violent extremists and others of that ilk who got inspired by what they saw in a very sick way, but got inspired by what they saw by video on October 7th and have essentially tried to echo the call for attacks against uh, various groups, against Muslims, against Jewish individuals and institutions. I mean, we had a little Muslim boy who was killed and stabbed to death in the days after October 7th. We've had countless examples of anti-Semitic conduct and you know, greatly elevated number of, of attacks and threats. Um, in the aftermath of October 7th. So you have these sort of this variety of threat vectors all sort of coming toward us. And that has required us to do exactly what I said our first mission is, which is to equip all actors across the spectrum of the homeland sort of intelligence apparatus with the information they need to decide how best to protect their communities, their cities, their states. And that, you know, we've been putting out situation reports on a regular basis about, you know, all the activity, the related activity uh, that I just discussed in the aftermath of October 7th. We put out a good number of joint intelligence bulletins with the FBI and the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, we, you know, briefed countless individuals, both in the, the um, federal government and the state and local governments. We've worked with the faith community um, quite a bit since October 7th, the various organizations representing different faith communities who are being targeted at a much higher rate than before October 7th. Um, and so we're very actively involved in this effort, as is the whole intelligence community. And just to end on, I think, an even more sobering note, um, most, um, most analysts predict that this is not going away anytime soon. Uh, this is going to continue, obviously, the, the tensions that have grown out of October 7th are going to remain. Um, it, regardless of how active or inactive the 
Israel's military operation is. That impact is being felt across the world, and there's a question of a wider war in the Middle East. So I, I, I think that was a, a very, very uh, uh, strong response to the question I a- asked you. I want to shift a little bit to domestic again. We just came out of the third anniversary of January 6th. I want to ask you if you've had an opportunity uh, since taking this job, the job that you're assigned in and your responsibilities, have you had an opportunity to look at how your office performed in the run-up to January 6th, 2021? Was that part of your remit? Could you talk a little bit about that? How did the office do? How did DHS do? What were some of the lessons learned? Maybe you can briefly summarize uh, your perspectives on that. I know that's a loaded question, but I think it's an important one. Right. Well, um, you asked if I've had a chance to do that. What I have had a chance to do is read a really fascinating article by a gentleman by the name of Chris Costa that addresses January 6th and draws parallels between it and the troubles in Northern Ireland, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Um, and actually, if, if anything, it's one of those sort of bright rays of hope that maybe as happened in Ireland, we can get through some of the uh, tribalism and other cultural issues that are sort of uh, creating some of the difficulties that we're dealing with today that um, helped to produce January 6th. So I commend that article to our listeners as well. Um, Yeah, January 6th uh, was obviously well before I got here and, um, but was very much aware uh, as I went through my confirmation process of uh, sort of what led to the events of January 6, both in terms of how the attack um, happened, but then also what um, what intelli- what role INA and the rest of the intelligence community played in terms of the warning that was given. And there have been a number of different reports generated about um, the role of the intelligence community and specifically INA in the run up to January 6. Reports generated here internally at DHS, as well as um, actually one that just came out recently, uh, the Homeland Security Government Affairs Committee at um, uh, the Senate, a very thorough report, and then others. Um, and it's clear that there were indicia of threat, of the threat um, that didn't get sufficiently disseminated um, with the sufficient um, amount of alarm. Uh, and, but then there's also obviously a, a number of um, circumstances uh, that were present at the time that um, resulted in uh, insufficient reaction to whatever indicators of violence and threat there were. So there are a variety of different things that led to the inability of the people, the, the officers up in Capitol Hill to resist the, um, the attack. That, um, but definitely intelligence um, uh, sort of owns part of that, uh, that cause. And one of the things that the secretary asked me to do, frankly, when he first talked to me about this job, was to take a hard look at the January 6th situation. Not only January 6th, other times when there had been issues um, raised that INA was um, involved in, such as Portland, the Portland. Um, situation in the summer of 2020 and others and see what lessons can be drawn from those situations and then try to build in processes and protections that'll prevent those issues from arising in the future. And that's exactly what we've done. And I would say the one thing I've, um, I've been very impressed with um, in regards to this agency, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this many times publicly, and it, um, it's striking to me. Um, government organizations, and you would know this, Chris, intuitively, some organizations are more resistant to second guessing themselves, to stepping back, maybe acknowledging that something wasn't done right, and then rethinking what they did and should have done. This organization is not like that. It's the opposite. It's open to change. It's open to rethinking. It's introspective. And that's been, that's made our job here so much easier because we're able to acknowledge, okay, this worked well, this didn't work well. How do we fix the latter and uh, bolster the, the former? And so that's what we've done. Now, you know, well before I started here, 
a number of things started happening on the domestic terrorism front. We stood up a domestic terrorism branch of uh, analysts who have been producing domestic terrorism products on a regular basis. Um, all you know, consistent with and pursuant to the, the national strategy on domestic terrorism that was issued, I think, in early 2021. Um, we've also uh, worked hard to make sure that we're we're knitted up with the FBI, for example, because that we and the FBI sort of shared jurisdiction in this area. Um, but back to what I said about our missions, the important thing when you're doing domestic terrorism work is that you always keep your eye on that third mission the protection of the privacy and civil liberties. Because think about the January 6th situation. January 6th, the indicators of threat were present and they're they were largely present in social media um, and the open source space that we're allowed to go into. We can, we can look in the open source um, space. We can do so and we can collect, but we have to be overt about it. We can't be covert and we can, or, or get publicly available information that's you know, on the internet. Um, but there was information like that present on January 5th that one could say would have given us, um, would give a cause for a, a, a stronger alert about the coming threat. That work, though, is, you know, a matter of us looking at people's, oftentimes U.S. persons communication uh, on the Internet. And we have to be very careful about how we do that. And we have to make sure that to the extent that we're reviewing and collecting information for, out of concerns for domestic terrorism, that we're doing it um, solely for that. And given that domestic terrorism grows out of ideological views and political views, it largely comes out of people's views about politics politics being and political rhetoric and political thought being the most centrally core protected constitutional activity there is. You have to be very careful to make sure that we're not targeting people's discussions about politics, about First Amendment protected activity, and we're only collecting on that which we believe is leading to violence. And so that comes back full circle to the primacy of that third mission that we have, which is we have to be effective against domestic terrorists, but we have to make sure that, that in the course of doing that, we're not stepping on people's First Amendment rights. And we've done a lot here to, to um, effectuate that. Not only do we have the domestic terrorism branch, but we also now have a new transparency and oversight um, office that reports directly to me. We've uh, consolidated and enhanced our oversight processes in countless ways. We've taken a hard look at our collection authorities and put new supervision in to make sure that when we're collecting, we're only doing it the way I described. We also have, and this predates me by a significant amount of time, we have a process in place where all our analytical products are reviewed by the Civil Rights and Civil Liberty Office here at DHS, by the Privacy Office at DHS, by the Office of General Counsel to make sure that whatever we're putting out to our partners is consistent with those principles of civil liberties uh, and civil rights and privacy. So across all our operations, we have this um, sort of apparatus to ensure that we, are, that we have robust oversight of civil liberties uh, and privacy protections. And that's absolutely critical in all areas, but even more absolutely critical in the domestic terrorism area, where it's so hard to draw that line between violent rhetoric and First Amendment protected rhetoric. So two quick points. The first point is I want to just reiterate my experiences I share with you in terms of DHS being self-critical and having the uh, the awareness to really look at lessons learned internally. So I agree with you completely. And that's my experience. And you and I never talked about that. So I appreciate you highlighting that for your community, for your employees across the entire enterprise. And secondly, you talked a lot about collection. Can you just put a finer point on dissemination? Because it seems to me dissemination is part of the problem or it was uh, on January 6, 2021. Um, so how do you disseminate the the uh, threat reporting to the tribal leaders, to the uh, state police, et cetera? Oh, great question. So just to step back, obviously, for, um, you know, just intelligence 101, you have the intelligence cycle, 
right? You, so you set the requirements, the priorities for uh, the, the topical areas upon w for which you're going to collect intelligence and then uh, analyze and disseminate. So you got the setting the requirements, then you have collection, you, you know, you collect the information based on those requirements. You then analyze that collection and produce analytical products, drawing inferences from the intelligence you collect that are useful to your partners, to the, your, the consumers of your intelligence, because it informs them about things they have to make decisions about, whether it's mayors or governors or police chiefs deciding how to allocate resources. Um, and then you then disseminate that intelligence, right? So that's just roughly the cycle. Um, and so we do the whole cycle. We are a full-fledged intelligence agency by, by statute. And so we do that whole statute, the, the whole cycle. And um, the dissemination is really a, the, the key step in many ways, because as I said, we are the ones who are statutorily mandated to be the information sharers with the SLTTP partners. And so we have a mechanism, the Homeland Security Intelligence Network, that is um, that has an intelligence component to it. And our state and local partners are all members of that. And they get, this is sensitive but unclassified information. Uh, and they get those products. They post products on it as well. And we've got thousands of products. And so we put that out. And so every one of our unclassified documents gets uh, posted on that um, and, and put out. And we, uh, one of the things we really focus on as is to be an intelligence agency that focuses on, on getting information out in a form that those partners, those SLTTP partners can actually use. And that largely means unclassified. So we'll often take intelligence that might've been collected at a highly sensitive level through classified means and send out products that are intentionally tailored to be unclassified so that we can um, we can advise people who might not have clearances out in state and local governments. So we do that through the Homeland Security Intelligence Network. Um, and we're constantly working with our partners to try to improve the delivery of our products, both in terms of the um, usability of the system, but also in terms of the content of our products. We have myriad different groups that come in and advise us about what is useful and what is more useful and what's less useful. Uh, and as an example, just recently, I think uh, last year, we um, were able to take the Hisson Intel uh, portal and then make it available on, on an iPhone. Um, so now you, you can have an app. So you can be a police officer. You don't need to be tethered to your desk. You can be out in a squad car with a little extra time and you can go on Hisson and you can look up the most recent um, products about whichever threat you're interested in, which I think has made it much more useful uh, to our partners. So that's an example. It's just sort of an overview of, of how we do dissemination. And um, it's been a focus of, our, of the secretary and the deputy secretary who sort of very intimately understand the importance of the relationship between us and our partners. It's been a focus of theirs to make sure that we are hitting the mark when it comes to meeting the intelligence needs of our partners. So I have several more questions, but what I wanna do is, is ask you one more question so, so we can turn to our audience and make sure they have an opportunity to ask you questions that they might have. I wanna ask a final question and I'm also gonna provide a book recommendation, which our audience is very much used to. Um, first of all, this has been a great chat and I've learned a lot and uh, I appreciate uh, some of the ground that you covered today. It's uh, very useful. And I think it'll be very useful for our international audience to see how very different our intelligence community is perhaps from their own. So more personally or, or more um, direct in terms of your role and your vision, what are you gonna be doing in terms of your future, your vision, for DHS in the next few years, years. Assuming you stick around in DHS, um, continue doing the great work that you're doing, what is your vision for DHS in the future? What are some of your priorities? Maybe we haven't already talked about today. No, thanks for that question. And look, um, regardless of what happens to me right now, we have a really strong team in place here. We've got a um, an organization, a thousand people or so that's doing 
really strong work, but also we're going through a transformation or transformational period right now um, where we're, we've realigned the organization. I, I mentioned that we have the new transparency and oversight um, focus in the organization and that's institutionalized in a new section. There are a variety of different changes that we made to make um, our organization more effective. Uh, and we're also going through sort of reprioritization process right now, making sure that we are focusing on those areas that are most critical and that we have the ability, a distinct ability to be effective. So for example, um, you know, there are myriad threats to the homeland uh, from all adversaries overseas and elsewhere. Um, some of them are things that we are well positioned to collect on or do intelligence analysis on, and others maybe not. Um, for example, the border uh, and the drug trade and the cartels and fentanyl and human smuggling. We are uniquely positioned to do intelligence work there because we're in the same department as CBP and they're down there on the border collecting that intelligence. We have a strong relationship, we're knitted up, we work closely together. And the fentanyl threat is as serious a threat as you're going to get. I mean, we lost, what, 100,000 people or so last year to fentanyl deaths. So that's an area where we're, as we go through this sort of reprioritization, we're thinking that's an area where we need to double down both in terms of focus and resources because the output from us and our work is going to be so much more impactful than it will be, let's say, in another area. So that's an, that's an exercise we're going through right now. I want to make sure that we see that through. Um, and um, and you know this will be done regardless of what happens to me. We've got a strong team here, and we'll carry it on. Um, but I think the so the overall answer is we can't be all things to everybody. You know we have the authority to do intelligence work as to all threats to the homeland. What we really need to do with our people and our resources, which are finite, is to focus on those areas, and that's what we're doing. Whether it's domestic terrorism, whether it's um, uh, the border. Uh, those areas where we can really help our partners and help our partners help to give them, you know, what has been termed decisional advantage. In other words, giving them the information that they can use to be better positioned to meet and counter threats before they actually come to fruition in their jurisdictions. Well, great insights. I want to make a book recommendation and we will pivot to questions. I, I assume we have a lot of questions teed up. This has been fascinating. The book I recommend is by Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware, God, Guns, and Sedition, Far-Right Terrorism in America. It covers down on some of the things we've alluded to in today's discussion, and certainly domestic terrorism. And I think it's a very important, albeit sobering book, and uh, I highly recommend it. Over to you, Amanda. How many thousand? Can I, can I, can I jump? Can yes. I sit on that for a second? Um, just to say, I don't know Jason, but um, I've known Bruce Hoffman for years, decades. Um, and he's one of the foremost thinkers on the on terrorism issues generally and um, incredibly insightful. So anything that he writes, I'd recommend very highly. Yeah, I wouldn't be teaching at Georgetown if, if, if I didn't uh, follow Bruce and I, I like to tell people in different settings that he coached me and mentored me while I was at the White House. He came into our space and offered me advice. Uh, we had a whole lot of humility. We knew uh, that that we couldn't be all things to everyone as well. So I really appreciate you saying that about Dr. Hoffman and and Jacob Ware is, uh, is very sharp and I think he's also teaching. Over to you, Amanda. We have a wide array and wide ranging questions. One came in, in moments into the session. This is from a frequent attendee in the UK, a former intelligence analyst. And he wants to know how the secretary's experience of chief of staff to director Mueller and for president um, George W. Bush, how that experience plays out in managing, delegating and coordinating across US and with foreign partners? Wow, that's a, a fascinating question. I can go on for hours, which is a threat. I don't, don't worry, I, I won't carry out that threat. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, there's so many things I learned from uh, working for uh, both of those gentlemen. Um, and I, I've known Director Mueller for many years and had the honor of working for him in the um, 
general counsel and chief of staff of the FBI, 2002 to 04, right, as the Bureau was going through its own transformation to meet the needs of 9-11 or the needs that were highlighted by 9-11. And um, so one of the lessons I drew from those experiences um, was just that, um, stepping back and taking a, a look at the organization and thinking macro. And it's so hard in these jobs when you've got it's constant fire drills, you know, there's something's blown up and you've got to address it. It's so easy to sort of get in the rhythm of responding to those things without stepping back and thinking, okay, we're an organization that needs to evolve. Every government organization needs to be constantly changing. If it's, if it remains the same, then it's going to be, it's going to ossify. And so of course, after 9-11, there was a call to change the FBI. And so there was a, a real imperative to do so. But it was a fascinating exercise in stepping back. And this is what I talked about earlier about being receptive to introspection and change. Stepping back and saying, okay, maybe we do need to change with a changing threat. This isn't 1932, you know, anymore. We need to th think differently. That was a fascinating and also really valuable lesson. And it's, I think it served me well here. Um, uh, working uh, as the president's Homeland Security Advisor is an incredible honor, but also fascinating. And Chris, you you know what it's like. It's a singular experience to work at the White House because, you know, I was 20 years in the Justice Department. And you go, to, you know, in one slice of the government, the interagency process, and suddenly you're there seeing all the slices. And so you just, you learn about the criticality of what the, the questioner said about work, being able to work with other partners throughout the intelligence community and the rest of the government. And you see how important it is to build consensus uh, around shared concerns. Um, and then the last thing you mentioned um, about our foreign partners is um, that in the intelligence space, um, we're all connected and we rise and fall together with our allies and friends. And there's not a threat that we face here in the United States that doesn't, that we don't have share some common concern with those overseas. And I've highlighted the REMV, the racially motivated violent extremists. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of them who are purely domestic and just get animated by their issue and decide to lash out here in the United States. But a lot of it is also connected with REMVs overseas in Western Europe. And you see the connectivity now with the internet, that connectivity happens in real time. So making sure that we are lashed up with our foreign partners, uh, those in the UK, of course, our closest ally uh, throughout history is absolutely critical. And even though my area, our area here focuses on the homeland, it's just as imperative on us to work closer with our foreign partners as it is on the rest of the intelligence community. Um, this, I wanna make sure to make the attribution of the asker of this question clear. This comes from a correspondent um, of a Japanese newspaper. Uh, so if that, and I like your choice of 7-Eleven coffee. Yes. Well done, sir. Thank you. I, I, I wanted quantity. I like it. I like <laughs> it. I like little, it. little, you know, China coffee cups. I wanted you, you, you need to guzzle some mm -hmm. caffeine. Sorry, I had to comment on that. Um, this comes from a Japanese uh, newspaper correspondent asking about the spy war between the US and China. Are Chinese spies more intense than those of the former Soviet Union? Also, it has been reported that several incidents have occurred in the past year in which ordinary Chinese citizens have attempted to break through the gates of US military bases. Is this part of espionage activities? Are those real events? Can you comment, either of you? Um, interesting. Uh, and, and Chris, feel free to jump in on this. Uh, I, I can't speak to the gate crashing question, um, so I, I wouldn't be able to address that. But um, interesting question, drawing uh, a comparison between the espionage threat from the PRC today versus the espionage threat from the Soviet Union back during the Cold War. Um, and you know that that's a time in history, though one could argue that we're seeing a lot of the same kind of efforts from this post-Soviet Union Russia today um, as we were before the fall of the wall and the, the fall of the Soviet Union. 
Um, look, the um, the world has changed with technology and with globalization. It's just it's a more integrated world, and espionage is some way it's facilitated by that, right? I mean, we can now do you know it used to be you had to do dead drops and you know park benches. Um, nowadays, it's all done by cyber, right? Uh, and you can steal information by cyber means. You can disrupt um, infrastructure, critical infrastructure by cyber means. So in some ways, it's almost an unfair comparison between China now and the Soviet Union back in, let's say, the 80s. Um, but I think it is useful to note that, you know, with China, and partly this is their program, uh, partly this is the capability of their totalitarian state, but they are, are um, I mean, it is, it's a whole of government effort on the part of China to conduct espionage. And that's both traditional espionage targeting the government, trying to get government secrets, but also stealing IP and um, economic secrets. And that's been going on for quite some time, uh, you know, decades, and they've been sharpening their skills. And I mean, we've seen it. You've been able to see that some of their industries have been able to leap ahead because they've stolen the technology and that we work to develop here in our corporations, they stole it, applied it, and then caught up. And um, so uh, that's not going to stop. And uh, that's going to be a consistent threat. Chris, do you want to? Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity. And I very much appreciate the question. I would point the correspondent to our September discussion with Director Ray, where he talked about both the Russian threat and how significant the Chinese espionage threat is. And uh, just to underscore that, uh, after the September spy chat here with Director Ray, there was a meeting with the Five Eyes in Silicon Valley where they met specifically in Silicon Valley to talk about the threat of China directed uh, uh, against uh, commercial entities. And this is the Five Eyes. So uh, uh, talking about how threatening China is in terms of espionage and the proliferation of the technologies, as the secretary talked about, um, has changed the whole uh, you know, threat matrix. So counterintelligence is of significant concern. And we hear that periodically on our spy chats when we bring people in specifically to talk about China as a as a threat and a competitor. And uh, I think we have some future programs that will specifically talk about China in terms of the counter espionage threat. So thank you very much for the opportunity to answer. What else do you have, Amanda? I love this question probably because I've lived in DC so much of my life. How does DC's unique situation as a city significantly impacted by Congress impact your work, such as dealing with the events on January 6th? Hmm. Hmm. Since we all live, we all, you know, we all lived through that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, well, I'll give a short answer and then a longer answer. The short answer is as to January 6th, obviously, you know, Congress was the target. They were the victim. Um, so uh, that's, you know, we both here at INA, but also with our colleagues of the rest of DHS and then the rest of the federal law enforcement and intelligence communities, we've had to work very closely with Congress um, to, you know, protect against any further violence of that type, but also to look back at what worked and didn't work before January 6th and work jointly with Congress and the Capitol Police, et cetera. So, um, you know, that that incident was a sort of an opportunity for a uniquely high level of interaction with Congress. But to step back, and I think what you were saying about what you, you know, your experience in DC, it's, um, I grew up here in DC and when you work in DC, really in any capacity, Congress is a presence, Congress is a reality and obviously, working in the intelligence community where um, the intelligence community is set up designedly to be overseen by Congress, right? We're, we're overseen internally within the executive branch. We're overseen by the courts in various ways. Congress is a critical part of the structure that gives the American people comfort that we're doing things right. 
because most of what we do doesn't end up in court where it's being seen by judges or scrutinized by judges, whatever. Our work is being done, you know, without sort of public exposure. And it's really critical that intelligence committees are able to conduct oversight of what we do, um, as well as the home, Homeland Security committees. So uh, it's, you know, we're constantly thinking about what we have to inform Congress about, what we need to solicit their views about, um, and, uh, and, and thinking about, you know, for example, what authorities they feel we should and shouldn't have. We just had a, last year, we went through what ended up being, I think, a very healthy process of, um, there, was, there was a provision inserted into the Intelligence Authorization Act that would have limited our collection capabilities. We then went back and forth with the sponsors of that, that provision, as well as other members, and laid out you know, what it is we're doing, what protections we have, well, how useful those collection capabilities are, what those they're producing of use to our to us and to our partners, the protections we have in place, the protections we're putting in place, and then ended up at a um, with legislation at the end of last year that put some important limitations and safeguards in place, but also maintained our ability to conduct the collection that we need to collect, similar to what I'm hoping will happen with the 702 debate. And so that was a good thing at the end of the day. And that was a result of us sort of having open door engagement with Congress. So that's, um, I think anybody in the intelligence community would probably give you the same answer that that's a critically important relationship. Amanda, we should take a couple more questions. If yeah, we, if yeah. I The one I'm, I'm very interested in, um, this, how is AI being used by your team and what measures are being taken to combat the potentially negative impacts of AI? No, good question. And, um, and I'll answer sort of on behalf of DHS generally. So the um, secretary actually uh, directed that there be a um, initiative focused on AI and emerging technology um, and both uh, in both respects. One respect being you know, how can we use it to improve our capabilities, to improve our, whether it's investigative capabilities on the uh, law enforcement side, whether it's, you know, whatever, however else we could use AI, but also look at the threat. And you can look at any, there are myriad ways that, well, like any new technology, um, whether it's AI, whether it's drones, you know, there are great benefits to society of that technology, but then there are uh, heightened threats as a result of that technology. So with AI, I mean, you can think of you know, the fraudsters, frauds that are perpetrated using AI, deep fakes that are, you know, the product of AI that can then be used for fraudulent purposes. So it's, uh, it's a serious concern. And so there's been a, the, this, the secretary has really focused us on us being sort of across DHS, looking for how we can appropriately use AI and do so with due respect for civil liberties and privacy, but also um, how we can anticipate and counter the malign use of AI. Um, very quick final one since we are running out of time and the person says they're, they're a rookie. And I love when we get a rookie and want to ask their question, which um, what's the division of labor between the DHS and FBI when it comes to foreign espionage in the U.S.? That's a great question, and um, uh, not a rookie question at all, actually. That's a very <laughs> veteran question, I'd say. Look, and I can answer both as to espionage, but also as to sort of, sort of all homeland threats. The, the Bureau and we have overlapping jurisdiction in a number of ways. The Bureau is a law enforcement agency, but also an intelligence agency, and effectively much more so an intelligence agency post 9-11, um, which really, since 9-11 it's really built its, its intelligence capabilities. We're an intelligence agency, and so we have sort of overlapping um, jurisdiction, and we have sort of, as a matter of practice, sort of roughed out where we take the lead, they take the lead. As I said, we're the statutorily mandated sort of lead for purposes of information sharing with the SLTTP partners. They obviously do it as well. Um, we, I mentioned earlier that we had you know, bulletins that we put out after October 7th. They're 
tri-sealed. In other words, we do it jointly with the Bureau and us and uh, NCTC. So we work very collaboratively with them. And that was the way this was set up. We were set up post 9-11 with the idea that we would work with the FBI. They have a law enforcement capability that we, the INA, do not have, um, but we, we augment their intelligence um, dissemination. And we have relationships that, you know, in areas and uh, levels of strength that they don't have and vice versa. So we work very closely with them. And that's one of the joys of uh, this job that I get to work with my old colleagues on a regular basis. Any final comments, Chris? Yeah, I just, I do want to offer a final comment or a final comment. First of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the secretary for flagging an article that I wrote last year. I'm very grateful that somebody read it. I will ensure that our staff disseminates it to all the folks that are joining today. I think it's universal and it still reflects um, my perspectives on important questions relating to January 6th through the lens of traveling overseas. But I want to thank you, your staff, and in, in, in particular for your leadership of DHS in terms of intelligence and analysis. So thank you very much, Secretary. Thanks for the great questions from our audience. It's gonna be a great spy chat year. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Amanda. Well, I echo the thanks for to the Secretary, to the audience for the great questions. Chris, for queuing everything up and and also for your comments when uh, you had to hold down the fort when we lost uh, lost the secretary and everyone was terrific. Thanks to your team, secretary, for getting you back to us so speedily. Um, if you would like to see this again, and we will probably cut out those moments, you'll, it will be on our YouTube very soon. And I hope you'll look at our website for other programs that we have coming up virtually and in person. We have uh, some really cool stuff planned for 2024. And thank you, Secretary Weinstein, for helping us start the year uh, at such a high level. Everyone take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.